Hello and welcome to Film Talk with AJ Dean. I'm AJ Dean, your host, and I have the amazing Paul Vato as my co-host. Want to say hello to him. Hi, Paul. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful, AJ. Thank you so much for having me. As always, I'm so looking forward to uh, this week's guest. Me too. I'm so excited because guess what? We have Jason Stewart with us this evening. So excited. He's an actor, comedian, producer, and writer. Let's give him a very warm welcome. Hi, Jason. How are you? So glad you're here. Thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's great. So, Paul, um, I'm so excited. We're going to jump yeah, right, we're gonna into right into it. We have these two great movie posters on screen. They're actually shows. No, um, no, they're both series. Oh, they're both series. <laughs> Goliath, Goliath is a, uh, starring, is a David E. Kelly series starring Billy Bob Thornton. And each year it has a different case. It's very similar to a show they did, Stephen Bochco did in the... Uh, uh, I think it was in the 90s, called Murder One, which I actually did a part on. Uh, so each each uh, season is a, a full case. And the, the Billy Bob plays this sort of ex-alcoholic lawyer. And I play, I'm in season four, and I got to be in a scene with a, uh, J.K. Simmons, Oscar-winning actor, uh, Bruce Dern, two-time Oscar-nominated actor, Haley Joe Osment, one time nominated for The Sixth Sense, and the film, the TV show, not film, TV show was, uh, you know, starring Billy Bob Thornton, and it was just like, wow. I was, I was pretty. I, I just, we just got back from COVID, so I was a little, you know, intimidated. And I, I played the heart, uh, the head of the board of a pharmaceutical company named Charles. What a great role. And how was it working on set there? What, you know, did you meet, get to well, meet? We were, first, it was supposed to be in a boardroom and then they changed it because of COVID and it was in this guy's house who was a million millionaire. And, it, you know, we were like, it was sort of uncomfortably weird because I was so far away from him. Everybody was so far apart. It was just so strange. And the minute we, they yelled cut, we put our masks on and our shields and our you know, gloves and hazmat suits, and it was just crazy. But uh, Bruce Dern didn't seem to care very much. J.K. cared a lot more and kept his distance and was a little more safe. And uh, uh, I guess, and he was very sweet, uh, the kid, um, Haley, Haley Joe, was very, very sweet. And I was a little nervous, I have to say, and I played a powerful guy who uh, realized that I was going to have to tell this guy, J.K. Simmons, who's a real jerk, that you know, he what's going to happen is not going to happen. And uh, Bruce Dern is my boss, and he came by and he kept uh, he go like this, hey Charlie, and he, you know he he started off in Charles is doing a good job and da da da, and then by the time that we third or fourth take, it's hey Charlie and da da da, and I'm thinking, God, that's Bruce Dern from coming home, you know. I got to work with him. It was just sort of I, I couldn't get past that. So. Uh, my character in the actual thing is a bit intimidated by what's going on. So it was, uh, it sort of worked. So you used that in the role then. You could use that real on the set moment. I always do. I always use what's going on if I can. That seems to be the, the best way to do things. That and is and What a gift, you know, after being locked up for, you know, a year or two. And I bet you were thrilled to work with Bruce Stern and um, J.K. Simmons. Yeah, J.K. Simmons. Wow, amazing. And um, so, after, so it it's for the fourth season. So, how can people watch you on on that episode? Well, they can watch the series by going to Amazon. It's on Amazon Prime. You can see the clip on my website, which is my name, JasonStewart.com. S T U A R T. And uh, you can see it's it's the first thing in my demo reel on the on my on the video page of my website. Congratulations! You know um, I'm so proud of you, Jason. You're working. You're working through the COVID thing, and it's it's like um, div you know being pushed aside now because everyone's getting back to work, and that's well, it's hard because everybody is doing everything. 
Yeah. I mean, the all the great roles are going to to people. I'm competing with people who have had Oscar nominations and Emmy nominations and Tony this and Golden Globe that. And you know, it's 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 a much more competitive world right now. Yes, and you're up there with them. So we're so oh. proud of you. You were so proud of you, yes, right, Paul, that, that you're up there doing that and representing us in such a wonderful way. And um, can you tell us a little bit about Smothered? We'd love to, Jason Stewart well, uh, and Mitch Nera. Yeah. Uh, tw around three years ago, Mitch Hera, who's an actor friend, a writer friend of mine, actor writer, uh, had asked me if I wanted to do, we, are, we were always talking about doing something together. And both of us had appeared in each other's projects quite a bit over the years and we knew each other as actor friends and uh he uh, we always had this idea that we would be this couple that was bickering and so uh we first started we were going to do this youtube show just for fun that these two guys were constantly in therapy and then we started writing it and it became much more involved and it wasn't just a little improv there was going to be a couple of minutes it turned into seven uh five to eight minute episodes and smothered is about these two guys who've been in a relationship for 30 years who hate each other but can't afford to get divorced we got nominated for the queerty awards mitch and i got nominated for best actor and also best series digital series and we also got nominated uh, no we won an award in amsterdam at a film festival which was four film festivals and one as best comedy and then we were up for an Emmy nomination. We didn't get it, but we were on the list, which apparently is really hard for an independent project. And we were on the list of uh, both of us for 11 actors wow. that were up for best actors. John Travolta, Kevin Hart, J.D. Smooth, who won someone from uh, 30 Rock and somebody from Seth Meyers. So you knew that it was the whole studio thing. So just to get on the list was sort of cool. And then we were one of 25 shows that were on the list for short form. Uh, Emmy nomination primetime. And then uh, we were also nominated for the um, Indie Series Award. And uh, we got nominated for Best Short Form Series, uh, Best Actor, Me, and then two of the guest stars, Clint Bowers and um, Pancho Omolder, were nominated for Best Guest Actor. So we had four nominations, and I actually won Best Actor in a comedy. Yeah. Congratulations, Jason. Uh, who thought that I would get you know, win, a, win an award for playing a gay guy, being a gay guy in a show. <laughs> Somebody would have told me that, you know, 35, 40 years ago when I started, I just would never have believed them. And I was quite a, I've never been in, I've won a couple awards in my career, you know, at film festivals, small awards, and I've won some uh, uh, civil rights awards for my work at the Screen Actors Guild after I, as the head of the LGBTQ, uh, uh, co-chair of the LGBTQ committee that I created. With Duncan Crabtree Ireland, and that, that I co uh, um, chair right now with Tracy Godfrey, but I never um, ever had won an award show at a big theater where you'd walk up on stage and have to do. And I remember I got really nervous, you know, when they were all of a sudden I said, Oh, this is Mitch was kidding with me and talking through the whole show. And, and I'm sitting there going, Oh my God, this is my category. And I didn't even <laughs> hear them say best actor in a comedy. And then all of a sudden, when, and because my name is Stuart, I'm more towards the end in alphabetical order of the nominees. And I hear my name called and I went, did they just call my name? And you get this weird, and I, I got up and then I went back to the chair and I gave Mitch a hug and I said, did they say that? <laughs> yeah. And I went on stage and I just remember I thanked him. I thanked my mom and I thanked the, um, because I, I, my mom has been incredibly supportive. My hashtag, I don't live with my mother, I live next door. <laughs> I was just gonna ask you, your mother must be so proud of you. And I want to say, and give a special- and she, 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 and I called, she thought that she won. She won. <laughs> she it is with her, it's all, all about her, it's back to her. And in a way she did, you know, I was just gonna say, hi mom, and give a shout out to your, your wonderful mother because she's there as your supporter. And I know how much she means to you. And yes, she does live next door. That is so cool. And- Gloria, <laughs> Gloria, four times, uh, four husbands, Gloria, yes. <laughs> we love our mothers. None and of them got out alive. That's what I'm gonna say. None of them got out alive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is 
wonderful. That is great. So we want to say a special hello to your mom and also, and thank you very much because as you know, Mother's Day is coming up. So happy Mother's Day to your mom. Right, and we're going to go to the Red Lobster so she can get coconut shrimp. But we're going a couple of days before because we don't want to wait in the line. <laughs> that's the way to do it. That's, yeah. that's it. That's perfect, Jason. And, and tomorrow I'm, we're going on K Gay because I'm doing a show. I don't know when this will uh, be uh, on, but I'm doing a show in Idlewild, a stand up show called Call Your Mother with a bunch of comedians that talk about their mom. <laughs> and it's me, uh, Mina Hartland, and uh, my, my dear, dear friend, uh, Melissa. Uh, Greenberg. So it's one gay guy, one lesbian, and one straight girl. It's like a Benetton. Awesome. It's a Benetton ad. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds wonderful. What do you say, Paul? I love it. I, you know, uh, I like to find questions to ask that, that maybe not everybody else would, but I who, would love who, that. Ask the questions. Uh, wonderful, that. wonderful. Who was uh, Palm Springs first, you or your mother, or how did that wind up? Well, my mom that you happened to, to be neighbors. My mom moved here 25 years ago, and I've always lived in Los Angeles since I was a baby boy, since I was a year old. And my mom started getting older in her late, she's 85 now and still shops at Forever 71. <laughs> and she uh, she was getting older and ailing and needed, needed an advocate, basically. You know, as people get older, you need someone to help sure. you. Uh, sure. life so she moved back to los angeles in, uh, in 2016 and she sold her house and i wouldn't let her drive she i said mom she says she would drive to la to visit she said people keep hitting my car i said mom no it's you you're hitting that no it's not i'm you don't think i'm a good driver no i don't yeah, really not at all no you're how bad am i you're awful awful no i'm not awful you know and uh you know uh, so uh, I said, no car, you're going to move back to L.A. And I got her to an apartment at uh, La, La, uh, La Brea Tarpets, and she lived around 10 minutes from me. And uh, that's when it started, around five or six years ago. And then after three years, right around 2019, things started to get, you know, I broke up with a man that I was in love with. And I, got, I had this really big agent that I'd gotten from Birth of a Nation that went to another agency. And didn't take me because I wasn't on a series making a million dollars. And uh, so all these things happened. And I thought, well, I'm going to take a move. And then everybody started putting you yourself on tape. And then COVID hit. And, you know, I thought to myself, God, I can drive. And I drive back to L.A. I'm there around, you know, probably, I don't know, four or five days a, a month. You know, I'm probably there four or five days a month. So I'm there around 20 percent of the time. And uh, like when I was shooting second season of Smothered, I was there, you know, God, a lot. So um, it's easy to drive back and forth rather than live there and have to drive every day in it. So and sometimes I'll just go up for a meeting. I'll leave in the morning, go up for a meeting and then come back that evening after having dinner with a friend. But sometimes I just do it as a day trip. And then the next day I just sleep. <laughs> Wonderful. That's. The, and it, it, it is, it's so close. I mean, I'm in Vegas and you know, that's a little bit further uh, than Palm Springs, obviously. It's like but being a showgirl. Yeah, that's what you're, you're like a showgirl. That's <laughs> exactly right. But now that everything is on tape, uh, it's, you know, it doesn't matter really where you live. If you're in your- Oh yeah, I do, I do house. every day. I do interviews like this. I do, you know, I do, I, I, we have writing, we have production meetings on Zoom, everything. Our director lived in Portland. Are you in Portland, uh, AJ? Yes, I am. Our director, not Portland. She lived in Oakland. I'm sorry, Oakland. Oh, okay. Well, that's cl that's close enough. In Oakland, our director was in Oakland, and we I was in Palm Springs, and Mitch is in West Hollywood. So we had, we had rehearsals on Zoom, everything. So 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 <laughs> so you moved from West Hollywood to Palm Springs? No, no, I, I'm I didn't live in West Hollywood. I'm only gay. I didn't live there. I lived. <laughs> I lived, that was my question. All right. I, li okay. I lived in Hollywood near the uh, Melrose and uh, Melrose and uh, uh, Highland. I lived there. I lived. I lived. Okay. I lived right on the line of the Hancock Park area. Sure. And I lived there for on the in, on the same block in two different apartments for literally since eighty one. Wow! Wow! And, you know, I traveled so much with my work, either shooting a film or a TV show, or you know, being on the road doing stand ups. You know, so or hosting or whatever I was doing or, you know, speaking, that kind of stuff. That's great. What came, 
what came first, uh, the stand-up or the acting, or was it kind of acting. a... Acting came first. Okay. Always an actor. Uh, it's all I, I wanted to be like Dustin Hoffman. I wanted to be a character actor and play different roles and and be able to do different things. And when, when stand-ups started to change was probably in the, oh, I'd say in the late 2000, 2000s, you know, it started eight or nine, it started to change. I had just done my TV special, uh, making it to the middle, which I had done on uh, here TV. And uh, I remember that it changed because social media started to become a uh, part of it, but I didn't know how to work it. And my fans didn't know how to find me and I didn't know how to find them. And then I, I sat with myself and I said, what do I really want to do? Do I want to be a road company comic the rest of my life? I was out two weeks a month at, for, for 25 years, you know, and I thought, do I really want that? What are the, where are the opportunities for someone in my age range? What is really going on and what do I want? Because I think that I'd gone as far as an openly gay person could go. And people, you know, I think the people, people say, are people prejudiced still? I said, they're not prejudiced, but there is a bias. There's certainly a bias to age. And that I feel now. There's a bias to age if you're over 40 or 50 and, and how you're treated. And I was in a comedy room the other day, a Zoom room, and they were talking about who's relevant. And no one ever asked somebody if they're in their 20s or 30s, are they relevant? Because they're all going after the same audience. They don't respect an audience over 50. They don't, expect, they don't in, in the clubs, they just don't. And people say the business is about money. It really isn't. It's about power and about who the bookers think are cute and want to have sex with, I think, sometimes, or are attracted to. It doesn't seem like funny is the most important thing. It's about an attitude or a way of being. Comedy used to be you had to have laughs, but now it's a different thing. Not to say that it's wrong, but it's not what I grew up with. And uh, so I, I sat with myself and I said, I want to act more. And then I started to, and I got a really great guest shot on The Closer in 2009, 20, 20, 2009. And then um, from there, it just really changed my career because I stopped being just the funny gay guy or the uptight manager. Uh, those are the two versions of things that I started doing. I, the funny gay guy, I think I never really... Um, in terms of film and TV, I never really had that all girl productions kind of uh, act, a, a way. I've always, if, I always say if, if the Golden Girls were four gay men, I would be B. Arthur. You know, I would say, yeah, Ma, that's, you mm -hmm. know, I'd turn my head and go, tell her to get out of here. You know, I'd be the one. Yeah. That would, yeah, it's too much. You know, it's not me. You know, whatever. I'd have that line at the end of everything, that, that joke. You know what, Jason? We really need that. We need a uh, four gay guys. Oh, so honey, they've been trying for years. I don't. I, the idea of them do, letting four gay men, you know, over fifty, be in a sitcom together. Oh my gosh, wouldn't it be great though? Come on. I mean, this is. It would be, but I, it's the same thing when they did Golden Girls. So we tried to. We're trying to do that with Smothered, and we're trying to. We just finished our second season, and now we're going to try to sell it uh again we're going to go out and sell a pitch after the, the second season should come out in the fall and then the we have nine uh five to eight minute episodes or a little longer and we'll see if we can sell it we already have proof of uh, uh proof of uh what do you call it proof of concept concept already done mm -hmm. and um so we'll see what happens with that and if not i'll just plug along and act in the things i want to act um and look, look, you know, look for the people that I really want to be with. Yes, that's what it's about. And I want to talk a little bit about the movie, the uh, TV series uh, poster here, Smothered. Um, it's, uh, it looks like in the picture, you two get up to some fun stuff and you're wearing something like goggles and, a, and scarves on your head. Is that because you're riding motorcycles or what no, is that? No, we, we, if you watch, the, you, you have not watched the show, I'm guessing. Not yet, but I'm going, it's on my list. Yeah. You want to watch it? I wish you would have. It's called uh, Smothered. If you go to the website smotheredtv.com, and you can watch the series on Amazon or YouTube or Reverie or Apple TV or Hulu, Zush, Zosh, Roku, Ich, Ach. It's on all those things. <laughs> so go to smotheredtv.com. So this is the poster for the series. 
It's wonderful. Thank you for that. And um, so, Paul, over to you for uh, thoughts or questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to, I definitely, I just want to find out where I could maybe submit an audition because it could be also maybe one straight Latino guy uh, in your Golden Boys, uh, you know, or Smothered. Well, I don't have a Golden Boys show. <laughs> That's great. Jason, I wanted to uh, jump right these in. Are, and these are two guys over a certain age but i remember you know um uh, i was talking to uh stan zimmerman who was one of the writers on the show and he was talking about uh you know the idea that when that show started it was about four women over 50 who were still having sex and people just didn't think anybody would want to watch that and of course that's probably one of the most popular sitcoms uh in television history in the okay. same way who would want to watch a show about a crazy redhead with a with a husband who's Cuban. No one would believe that a mixed mm. marriage, and right? That, and then if she right, had a right. baby, people would be so shocked they wouldn't watch. You know, all the things. And, and uh, both shows, of course, have, have uh, withstood the, the test of time. Because uh, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Uh, at that time, when the Golden Girls were out, for me, it was you know, and I wasn't into say television or well I wasn't into acting so seeing it watching a show like that be I, I didn't give it a chance because it was like you know I, I'm a teenager or whatever and I'm a, I'm a guy like what do I have in 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 you know correlation uh with these old ladies on television but then discovering it later and realizing what a brilliant show it was how well, they well were, they, were, they were they were four incredible comedic actors you know B Arthur of course being mm -hmm. so brilliant and Betty White being so uh, incredibly funny and had such a light touch without you really even knowing how great she was. That's how great she was, is you could never see the seams. You know, Estelle Getty, Getty laugh out loud and, and, and just certainly the camp value of uh, Rue McClanahan. Sure, sure. I, I mean, it, amazing. What an amazing show. And so I'm glad that now I, I appreciate it and I love it and it's, such uh it was, it was so well written and hilarious and everything that you said so yeah definitely. so I, I i'd love to see you you know uh, i'd love to see you do that i mean that, well, watch smothered go to smothertv.com i was hoping you guys would have watched it before <laughs> sorry sorry we will jason we will and i want to know um what is most important to you jason in your life and what is your heart message for the world Oh, geez, I don't know. In terms of my work, since this is a film talk show, uh, seven years ago, I got cast in a movie called The Birth of a Nation, and I played a white heterosexual Christian plantation owner in 1831. And you can watch that movie if you want to on uh, Amazon also. It's for a couple dollars. Have you guys seen the movie? No? I, I, I saw it, uh, and man, it came, yeah, seven years ago. In the theater, yeah, it came out of the theater, then it went in to the theater, yeah. HBO, and then it went to uh, Amazon. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, for me, that's it was, it was for me the idea that I could get cast in a major supporting role playing a plantation owner in 1831. Who would believe that somebody like me, you know, being known for being for comedy, being known for being openly gay, being known for someone who did sitcoms and stand up, you know, and not having a, a much of a dramatic career that people knew about. And being able to get that job, shoot it, be a part of this theater company almost. That's what it was like doing it. Nate Parker had created this environment. He was the writer, producer, director, star of it. Creating this environment, you know, that's my fantasy of being in a work situation where you felt like you were there to do your best work. And just so there's so many things, there's so many stories. I don't know how much time we have, but there's so many stories. When I first got the part and I, I called his assistant and I said, I'm coming to, you know, I'm going to come to uh, Savannah a little early. I have a friend that lives in Jacksonville, a producer friend of mine, which is around two and a half, two, uh, an hour and 45 minutes away from Savannah where we were shooting. And I said, I'd like to meet with him before to talk about the character. And, you know, because I hate first days. And I think when you're doing uh, a film, and you know, I had eight scenes that you have a major supporting role, you know, you have to speak to the director about what they want. So you get a little bit of shorthand and you know, and I remember uh, 
he, uh, I called his assistant, who later I found out was Denzel Washington's daughter. I didn't know that. And uh, he kept changing the appointment. And I remember I drove there in this rent-a-car. And I remember I got there and it was almost like they were having Thanksgiving dinner in this house he rented in Savannah. And he was barefoot and he took me out to the garage where there was a office above the garage. And I was in a swivel chair just like this. And I remember he turned around to get the script and I said, thank you so much for casting me. And then he said, no, thank you. And I just completely almost lost it. And uh, this is the kind of guy that he was. Uh, they were, uh, where is it? It's in my, I'm in my office now. Um, one of these, I don't remember which, oh, Rage Magazine over there. It's up there. It's right, wait, it's right. Well, I can't do it. Um, <laughs> it's one of the things on the wall. Rage Magazine did a piece on me, you know, called The Birth of an Actor, written by this wonderful journalist named Tom Senzi, who recently passed away. God bless him. And he was so supportive of me. And um, in so many ways, such a great guy. And uh, he said during the interview, do you think we could get Nate Parker to, you know, do a quote for the interview. And I said, well, you know, the film opens in a couple of days. I don't think so, but here's his publicist, give him a call and they can set it up. So he uh, never said anything to me. And he sent me, this is the kind of guy he was. He, inter he interviewed me several times over the years. And he sent me the article and said, look, fact check it for me, just make sure. That's how cool he was with me. And I looked at, and I read the article and then there was a space in the article that said Nate Parker quote, but there was nothing there. So then when the article came out, uh, I think it was a couple weeks, uh, I think it was a couple weeks right after the movie had opened and he, or maybe two weeks or something. And he sent me the uh, magazines and he, and he called me and said, well, what did you think? I said, well, I read the article when you sent it to me on, online. I didn't read it again. I just looked at the pictures and that was it. <laughs> I didn't read it again. I said, you know, how much can I read about myself, Tom? And he said, read the article and i read it and in the article and i usually keep it here at my desk um nate parker wrote, wrote two paragraphs and sent it to him on me about what it was like to work with me and it just completely touched my soul and it's exactly who i want it want to be i wish i had it right in front of, oh my i have it in my book and then here's my book that came out two years ago called Shut Up, I'm Talking, which you can also get on Amazon. And uh, in The Birth of an Actor, he wrote this thing. And, and I always read it because whenever I get down or I feel like things are just completely, you know, I'm just so close to, to where I want to be, but I, I just don't know what, you know, um, I don't know what to do next. I read this and he says, Tom Senze wrote a cover story piece called The Birth Theater in the local magazine. Surprisingly, answer, uh, it, and this is what Nate wrote, Nate wrote. I hope I can get through it. It always gets to me. It was really all about his incredible work meeting me in the audition rooms, replied Parker. I wanted to stray away from the traditional psychopathic slave owner and instead present a character who had more relatable qualities, qualities some could almost perceive as likable. This would be, this, uh, this would create in, in an audience member a more complex journey as they grappled with the systematic effects of the period of American history. Jason walked in with an understanding of this vision. He brought a confidence, humility, and humor to the role in a way that helped achieve a needed balance across the characters and overall narrative. His onset instincts further validated his hiring as he constantly pursued brave choices that aided in expanding the breadth of the character. It just completely uh, changed me as a human to be, you know, a man of a certain age and worked as hard as I've worked over the years to get where I've gone. People have often said that I, you know, I beat myself up or I'm too hard on myself or the bar is too high. And now I even the bar is even higher because I just don't want to do anything that is after you do something like that in the last seven or eight years, you know, I probably turned down a couple, a, number, a couple of things. 
that I don't want to do anymore. I used to do everything. Somebody asked me recently to be in a film where I would play an art critic who wore a diaper. And I said, why is the guy wearing a diaper? He says, well, because he's in a bathhouse. And I said, oh, okay, well, I'm probably not going to be doing that. But thank you for asking. I really appreciate you thinking of me. Are, are, they, still, are they still hiring? Do you know? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But I mean, I just, you know, and I said, well, why do you want to do that? And he said, well, because it's funny. I said, well, there's no reason for that, you know? And I'm a yeah. big, big proponent of, if you watch my work, I don't know what you've seen of me, but if you watch my work, I'm a big proponent of behavior. And most people don't have behavior in their work. And that's what I noticed the most. I started, uh, during COVID, I started doing all these seminars where I would come in and just be a guest and speak on Zoom or in Clubhouse. And um, uh, and I started working for this gal, because I, I, I had done, uh, I went to her class and uh, I don't, um, uh, it's called the Winter Circle. And Wendy uh, mm -hmm. Allen Wright does this, uh, this, this class for people who want to be in show business. So, um, I started uh, actually teaching, which is really weird because I never really wanted to be a teacher, but I started coaching and I see myself more as an advocate or a guide. And, uh, you know, once or twice a month I do a class and then I coach people on occasion and bring people in the right direction and giving them their my experience, strength and hope. And I've, I've been putting myself on tape acting for probably 12 years. I started doing it 11, 12 years because I have a New Orleans agent. So I, I've always been doing that. So uh, I've always, you know, coached other actors for free as they've come and coached me. We sort of do it back and forth. So that's what I basically have been doing. And now occasionally I'll get paid for it. So that's nice. And I started doing that because I think of it, it's, it's a way of giving back and being a man of a certain age. And uh, it doesn't preclude me still continuing in my career and it doesn't preclude me in anything else. And uh, I can do it right from my uh, this chair right here. That is wonderful. Thank you so much, Jason, for reading that beautiful acknowledgement and appreciation uh, from your book. Um, and it says everything that's book is called "Shut Up, I'm Talking," and you can get <laughs> this book on Amazon. Absolutely. So go to Amazon and check I it may, out. I may be turning it into a solo show. I don't know. There's talk of it. <laughs> That'd be great. You know, what's wonderful about you, Jason, is that you feel and embody the emotions that, and you can speak for a lot of us and represent us. Um, That's what I've been told. It's interesting that you say that. And I never, I, 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 I yeah. I, I'm just I'll tell you, mind. I'll tell you why, because you have a comfortableness about you and an ease, if you will. Um, because you're a regular guy, but you can play the ones way at the top or at the full range. And so that's my reason why I think. How about you, Paul? Do you agree with that? He's on, I, a, yeah, he's on a planet. I totally so I don't, he's on a planet there. I don't know where he is. I'm in outer space. <laughs> and you're in some pink little, you know, I don't know what to say. It's like being inside of a uterus or something. I don't know what to it's very comfortable. I'll tell you what. <laughs> All's in space, and I am in my pink igloo or cocoon or whatever you want to call. <laughs> but you're right, Jason. So, um, but that's what I think. I think you have the empathy, uh, and you're empathetic with characters, and you feel deeply. So that in itself is perfect for being an actor because you can project that because you really feel it. Um, versus some people that, you know, uh, are, are good at other skills. What do you say, Paul? Don't you agree? Yeah, and, and I was, I was going to ask two things, and you've already answered one, which is, which is about your teaching. So that's wonderful to know that, that you are available, uh, whether it's with Wendy's program or, or I don't know if you teach also on your own. I do, but... I do privately. You can just go to my website, jasonstewart.com, S-T-U-A-R-T, and there's uh, my, my office, Modern artists and you can give me a call Correct. wonderful wonderful so i hope that people do and then and my other either i don't know observation or or question was going to be well i guess the question was 
do you think that having done comedy and, and being almost known as a comedic actor then did help you with that role of the plantation owner because um, I, you know when you're a bad person uh, you, you don't think you're a bad person, you know, and you still, you, you have your family, you have your friends, you know, they think you're, you're a swell guy uh, and maybe, you know, sure. Maybe you even make them laugh. Do you think that that added to the layers of this complex character? No, it's 1831. I'm a white heterosexual Christian plantation owner. You know, it's hard times at small farms like you and myself breaking evens hard enough for getting the heads impossible. Now to save some, I'll cut them back to a meal a day per head. Woo! You know, and, you know, you just, and that's just sort of halfway there. Mm -hmm. And so when I did that part, I read the script once and I never read it again because it was so difficult for me to see what, you know, I'd say, you know, 2015 was when I shot it. Jason Stewart, um, gay liberal Jew, couldn't really play that part in his head. I had to, you know, do each scene and what I was doing, what I wanted to accomplish. And I basically played an, uh, a mentor to Army Hammer's character. And I'm the older guy that taught the younger guy what to do with his slaves and with his plantation and how he could be a success. Mm -hmm. And that was my job. And that's what I did. And the N word I'd never really said before in my life. So I was in my hotel and practicing and I hear a knock at the door and it's the maid. She's like, what's going on in here? I hear voices. And I said, no, it's nothing. It's just the Republicans on TV. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You know, yeah. but, um, <laughs> I, I, I said that with conviction because the director, Nate, said he would cut if I didn't. And uh, I played each scene that way you know, trying to get something, trying to teach him, which is basically what I'm doing now with the kids and with, with some of my uh, clients and students. So, uh, you know, and it's so funny because I just did another film called, um, oh, it's a little comedy like Napoleon Dynamite. It's called uh, uh, Garlic Parmesan. And I play this very bad improv teacher who's sort of a dad, him and his daughter run this terrible groundlings type school in West Covina. So, so I seem to be in that kind of position a lot of times where I play that kind of character, you know. I wanted to ask an impromptu question, okay? This is a random question, hope it's okay. You mentioned that you are Jewish, is that right? Can we talk a little bit about that or is that off topic? No, why not? Okay, how much is, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you so much. How much is your faith or being Jewish? How, how has that shaped you or how do you draw on that for your roles? Well, my father's a Holocaust survivor, not the camps, but the ghettos like Adrian Brody and the pianist. And when I was a kid, my father used to say to me, when you go to the interview, this is what you do. You wear a tie and you let them know that you mean business. And what I took that to mean was, be your best self. And my dad was a guy who came to this country in 1949 without a, a, a nickel in his pocket, couldn't speak English, learned how to become a, a tie cutter in a necktie manufacturing company, created, a, you know, went from being a, a janitor to a tie cutter to re managing the department to managing to managing the company, to being a vice president, to being part owner, and then to being, uh, and then after that ended, he went into real estate and was a real estate. Uh, he owned uh, quite a bit of apartment buildings and he, he was my stepmother and he passed away 10 years ago. And uh, that, so he, he became a bit of a, a tycoon in that area. And I, I watched my father, his work ethic and the way he just showed up all the time. You know, he just showed up. And did the best and a lot of times he didn't do the best you know he didn't do the best because he didn't know and i think that's what i did i didn't know i just went in there and did the best we did the best that we could with the information that i had and that's what i would do is i would just show up and i kept showing up and i'm sure at times some people thought i was nuts and they thought how dare you because i could feel that a lot i remember going to the open call for the outsiders the coppola film and i remember the casting directors is there and I had my hair 
It was blonde, parted down the middle and layered. And I was wearing blue jeans and a cowboy boots and a vest from the suit that I'd worn to my high school graduation with a shirt without the collar, the striped shirts. And I remember I thought I looked so cute. And I thought I was so funny and, and everything. And I thought I was just this just funny, cute guy. And what I didn't realize was that everything about me, they you could tell they thought was wrong. And they looked at me like I didn't belong here. And I know the casting directors and I'd read for them years later, you know, they're both lovely gals. But at that time, that's what they, I remember they, I think, I don't know if it was Janet or Jane, but they looked at me and they, it was like, you're done. You're going home. You're really not right for this. So I didn't exist to them. I wasn't allowed to compete in the same area. Now, if this movie was being made right now, there would be a cute little funny gay guy with a high voice and who is a little bit feminine, a little bit kooky. There would be that character in there and that would have been okay. Or a sweet, sensitive gay guy, which I could have played. And that would have been okay, but not then they wouldn't let me. And I beat myself up for years about that. Years, you know, that I messed up that opportunity by not knowing that I should have been who I am. You know, how could, you know, 2022 20, know what he was doing in 1980, you know, or whatever the year was. I didn't know anything. I just showed up. Well, Jason, and, I, I'm so glad that you kept showing up because look at you now and and i think i'm so thankful it's changed as well i hope it's a lot better what do you what do you say jason oh yeah it's tons better i mean you know i'm going to vegas i'm doing a, a comedy club there in august i'm doing another uh, i'm going to oakland and doing a date in june at the alameda comedy club i'm i've got you know garlic parmesan coming out i've got the second season of smothered coming out uh, I've got new manager. I'm up for I'm up for a couple of things. I was very uh, excited. I was up for a real, really big role in uh, uh, the Bradley Cooper uh, new film Maestro. And just the fact that I was actually meeting with the head casting director, in you know, on Zoom, but meeting with that person, I was being treated that way. That's the way I, I'd always wanted to be treated not reading for an assistant or associate or putting yourself on tape and just sending it out there for a major part in a film you're going to you know it's a major supporting role or a nice supporting role if you're going to be doing that they'll want to meet with you and see who you are and see what you're about and uh, that was an incredible experience to have gone through and i have a great deal of uh, gratitude for that and jason it's your time to shine now um, isn't that right, Paul? What do you say, Paul? It is. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited that you're coming uh, to Vegas. But yeah, this sounds like this is oh, your, yeah. your time. I'll be there in Vegas. I'll be there in Vegas. Um, and you can go to my website, jasonstewart.com, S-T-U-A-R-T. If you want to watch Smother, there's a Smother button. You can watch. If you want to read my book, there's a, you know, there's a book button. You want to hear my comedy. I have a new album out that came out uh, during COVID called I'm the Daddy and I Have Candy. And that's <laughs> So there's all sorts of things to buy and watch, and everything's very reasonably priced, all under 20 bucks. Wonderful, and, wonderful. Where are you performing in Vegas? Uh, do you know which room? Uh, that's, I can't remember the club. Oh, wait a second. Yeah, I can. It's right here on my desktop. Because, Wise Guys? Is it Wise yeah, Guys? It's, uh, LA. It's called the Delir Delirious Comedy Club. Delir oh, yeah, downtown. I think downtown, it's downtown. Yeah. And then in, in Oakland, I am at the uh, Alameda Comedy Club. And then in North Hollywood, uh, on the 28th, I'll be at the Comedy Chateau. And then um, th this Saturday, I'm going to be at the uh, Rustic Theater in Idlewild. So I got one gig every month that's coming up. So Wonderful. we'll see what happens. And, uh, you know, auditioning and uh, meeting with people and, you know, in post production on the series and, Hopefully, the series will uh, go on to have a, a bigger life. That's my hope. We believe that. We're going to manifest that now, send good energy that way you so that it happens. Get on the phone and call somebody. <laughs> yeah, that too. That yeah. too, Jason. And um, I always so say to people, make the extra call. 
send the extra email. Yeah. Because you never know. You just never know. You never know. That's so true. I love that positivity, Jason. And um, I'm so sorry. We're, we need to start wrapping up the show, but we're going to do okay. final thoughts. And we're going to go over uh, to you, Jason, first for final thoughts, uh, whatever message that you would like to share with the world that's on your heart. Over to you, Jason. Well, people probably say, you know, why am I doing this show? What am I, you know, people will look at me and go, what do you, why are you on the show? Why are you talking to these people? Because I'm showing up. So somebody said, hey, I want you to come on my show. So I'm here to support you guys in the venture that you're doing. And you're creating your own reality of doing your own podcast. So I'm here to be of service to you and to share my experience, strength, and help with you guys. So I hope that you guys are a big success with this. And I hope that you, uh, uh, next time when you have me on the show, you watch my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go do that right now. That's a really good idea. Right yeah, up. I want to watch some others. And if you want to know about me, go to jasonstewart.com, S-T-U-A-R-T. And uh, that's it. <laughs> that's beautiful. And I'm going to do that right after the show. <laughs> It's, it's mandatory now. There's just no ifs, ands, or buts. Jeff and I are going to watch it and we're going to enjoy it. So thank you, Jason. <laughs> and then I'm going to watch This Is Us because I need a good cry. <laughs> Even the big girl has a boyfriend. She got, she got married twice already. I can't find somebody. <laughs> well, You're, go ahead, Paul. Well, well I was saying, uh, what are you doing at? What are you doing home? You should be over at uh, two cans or something if that's still around. Oh, you know way too much. <laughs> I know everything that's going on in uh, Palm Springs. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that. And um, so <laughs> over to you, Paul. <laughs> no, that, that that's that's wonderful. And, and you know, J Jason, I, I had I have read your bio because uh, you know when you talked about your father. Uh, talking about ties, I, I, I mean, I, I, I remember reading that in your bio that you show up and you show up prepared. I like that that's really what he meant. Maybe not literally just because he sold ties, meaning to wear a tie, but, but you know, to show day, up. That's prepared. what they did is they wore a tie, which was respect. Mm -hmm. and now, since we don't wear ties anymore, it's like I put on a shirt for you guys. I'm still wearing my underwear right now. Thank of course. You. We both are. Yeah, well, at least you're wearing underwear. So that's good. All right. Me too. I, I am as well. Okay. I even have my boots on. I have my boots on, everything. Not, not here. I'm ready to go swimming. I've got my swim trunks on. So. All right. And scene. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Jason, thank you. Take thank care. you, Jason. And until next time, we'll always be your fan. Oh, I have it backwards again. We'll always be your fan, Jason. Thank you again so much for being here. You're so important to us. And um, until next time, until we speak again, much success and love to you, Jason. Can Keep going on. Keep showing up, just like Jason says. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.